Hello and welcome again to Conscious TV. I'm Ian McNay and today our guest is Dr. Cribben Pillay. Hi, Hi Cribben. And Cribben really has had a very varied life, quite a fascinating man. And we're going to look at his life and he lives in a very non-dual world. We're going to look at that as well. But I want, first of all, to mention some of the books he's been involved with um, over the years. Learning to See, which is about self-discoveries through theatre groups, which he used to be involved in. The Story of the Forgetful Ice Lollies, which he wrote for his daughter and is available. The Numenon Journal, which has had, I think, ten editions over the years and still comes out sometimes. And a DVD called Brain Scam, um, which you can get from his website. And I forgot to mention that actually Cribben is an amateur magician and mentalist and a certain associate profession of leadership. I'm looking at my notes to make sure I get it all get it all right there. So, Cribben, you've been a searcher for a long time. Um, and I think it started when you were quite young, didn't it? When you felt that things didn't quite add up for you. Ian, I would say that um, in retrospect, uh, for no particular reason, that there was, uh, I think, a core fear as way back as I can remember, you know, as a maybe a four or five year old. And I don't attribute it to any, um, you know, unpleasant experience, you know, the, as a child. In fact, I would just say it was an existential condition which may have attracted experiences that were, un, that were unpleasant afterwards. So in other words, that was the attractor. Only now um, do I understand that that, uh, core uh, feeling of being fearful, uh, of feeling that something is not quite right, um, is our innate uh, sense of, of being separate. So when you say fearful, what do you mean? Can you give me some symptoms, an idea of what you felt? Uh, the things were not, you know, the things were not right. Uh, hmm. um, always concerned that my dad would not be there. So eventually when he did die, it was a, a traumatic experience for me. Um, uh, not only him, but that various loved ones will, would, would just suddenly not be there. You know, people that you have your emotional bonding with. Um, and that as a child, you, 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 th this is your world. And that, you know, without the, these these elements in your world, you, you know, you, you, you think, well, how am I going to survive? Mm. And, um, and then there was a pivotal experience, which we haven't spoken about, and I'm going to just tell you about this now. Um, people who know me would know that I, I, I love creamy cakes, you know. Um, and uh, I was about 13 this was 1970, and uh, in East London, South Africa, not East London, England, uh, we still had um, uh, what was called a cake boy. And it may not be a flattering term these days, but that's what they were known as. Yeah. And they were um, vendors who pushed around uh, a vending trolley that had cakes baked by the bakery. And they would come down the street almost like an ice cream man and, and sell cakes. And I saw a, a, a cake man and, and I bought a cake and then realized I needed a cold drink to go with it. And I wanted to cross the street to a shop um, at the other end. And I was knocked down by uh, a motor car. And in the instant of being knocked down and... I had a sense that my body was flung upward. Uh, I knew that there was no such thing as death. I just had this, uh, this absolute certainty that there was no such thing as death. Subsequent to that, of course, the body fell to the, to the road and there was injury sustained to the head. And I was rushed to hospital and all of that. And it took about a week or so to recover from what is, I think, fairly minor... Uh, uh, wounds at the time, although um, I'm now feeling the effects of some of, of what happened, you know. 
Um, that incident, I think, was the start of the search. The of wanting to, to of wanting to have that certainty again, of, of of not even it wasn't an intellectual certainty. It was almost seeing it, you know. It this a it was a knowing. Mm. But I was thirteen, you know, and um, uh, and there were certain things that, you know, as I grew up, I realized I was not wanting to confront. Uh, and one of the things I didn't want to confront was a knowing that my dad, I was about 14 or 15 at the time, that my dad didn't have much longer to live. Mm. You know, he was only in his early 50s at the time, but I just had this knowing, that, and I, and I didn't want to be around, so I pestered my parents to send me to England to live with my, um, my cousin here, and I went to school for a short while, and um, only returned when he died. Um, so yes, there was this... Um, movement within oneself which was really I think going back to that incident mm. of trying to find to have this knowing which was absolute um, but of course the you know uh, that knowing was uh, something that was uh, momentary it was there but the, the core fear was still still persisted and I think we all have different ways in which we try to to fill it up or to escape from it. And I had my own ways of doing it. There was the two things running. There was, yeah. the, there was the knowing and there was the core fear. Yeah. Mm. Yes. And then, of course, your father did die. He did die. A few years later, and that affected you greatly, didn't it? It affected me. I mean, uh, as you know, I, I, I've had a long um, history with the theatre, and I think there was part of my personality that also uh, was melodramatic. <laughs> uh, I'm just looking at that personality now. So, in other words, I was also, I think I can see myself being in love with the idea of having lost a father. I think that was another expression. Mm -hmm. It was a, a, look at me, look at, you know, pretty poor me. You know, uh, in some way, I, when I look at some of the, the, the poetry I wrote at the time, it was all very, it was very sentimental. It was all about what I have lost, you know, and I'm the most unique person in the world to have undergone this kind of suffering and pain and loss, you know, which I think was a pattern that, that, that then perpetuated itself in other forms in relationships etc etc yeah it's also understanding for a, for a, ch a child to go through that as yeah. well and handle it in that way yeah yeah and um it was one of these kinds of episodes of going through extreme pain through a loss that um i encountered krishnamurti accidentally in in a library you know, I um, a, book, you a book. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, I was very interested in 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 in, in psychic phenomena, um, and um, I I think at the time I was interested in the Rosicrucians, and they seemed to be offering all kinds of interesting experiences. And I was in the library, and I saw this book on Krishnamurti. I didn't know who he was, but I paged to the uh, index and I saw Rosicrucians mentioned. I said, oh, this is something interesting. And, and actually it was the inverse, because when I read the book, I realized that the book was actually uh, an utter and complete challenge to that worldview that what, of what the Rosicrucians presented. You know, it wasn't about uh, gaining experiences, having wonderful states, or, you know, whatever, psychic, uh, psychic states and, and conditions, but really it was about going through them. And, um, and then I was hooked. I was hooked on what Krishnamurti was pointing to, which was also another kind of subtle trap. Okay, so what was the main message you got from Krishnamurti? You know, the, uh, Ian, I would say that the message, first of all, 
because of my own background in, in the arts, in poetry, was the way he communicated. He was able to communicate a sense of the indefinable, a sense of the mysterious. And through the way he communicated, I had an intuitive sense, knowing that there could be an end to this constant feeling of being incomplete. Which is something I think, if we all look inside, we yeah. all have that somewhere. Yes. Yeah. And um, I, I took him literally. When he said no gurus, there were no gurus. Mm. He said, you know, no work. I, I didn't know anything about workshops and you know, go to therapy. I just took it literally. And that was, mm. uh, that was my saving grace, in fact. That uh, Although there was another kind of subtle trap because then everything was mediated through his words. You know, trying to, you, know you are trying to understand the, the world through what Krishnamurti is saying. And that's the, probably not what he intended, but, you know, that's what the brain does. That's what the mind does. Um, but certainly uh, it was very useful in... Um, in not going down too many wrong paths. I, I also am very, very uh, fortunate that I was brought up by a mother that um, had a very simple um, religious philosophy, you know. She taught us to, to pray in the Hindu way, but it was without much of the ritual. And it was simply really an intimate um, communion with God in whichever way you... Um, Envisage that, that that God. So just staying with Krishnamurti, I was looking at my notes, which I took from some notes that you sent me, and and you said that he also had the effect on you of intensifying the duality within. Yes, because when you receive the message, there's still a me that's trying to end whatever you're trying to end, the pain, the suffering, uh, or you're trying to reach some state that you believe uh, is what he's experiencing. You know. Okay. So in other words, you see Krishnamurti and you say, well, what a lovely human being he is, and I want to be like him. And you don't realize that there's a, a subtle duality happening here. I want to be like Krishnamurti. You want to achieve something. I want to achieve something. Yeah. And we don't question, although he's constantly pointing out that you question the I. Mm. You know, certainly we don't. We bypass that. That's one of the tricks the mind plays upon itself, you see. It sets up this intellectual platform of saying, well, I know what he's talking about. And then it simply goes on deluding itself into believing that it's uh, getting there. It's getting somewhere. Mm. And, um, and, you know... Uh, Krishna with himself in one of his talks says to someone, Sir, you've been here for 25 years. Why are you doing this to yourself? You know, and, and yet we, we listen to that and we smile and we nod um, knowingly uh, and um, we don't see that we're doing the same thing to ourselves. And I know then you um, discovered a book by Douglas Harding. I think it was 1989. Yes. And that was, that was kind of... That showed you another dimension of looking at looking at things that added to something you'd got from Krishnamurti. Yes, I would say what I got from Krishnamurti was something intuitive. I would say almost poetic. You know, it's like having an aesthetic experience when you see great art. But it, but largely it was two dimensional because it was words being translated by the brain to mean something. And then Douglas Harding's work was about actively doing experiential seeing exercises. And I remember reading his book, The Little Book of Life and Death, a second time. I previously read it, uh, I think, four years earlier and, you know, enjoyed it intellectually and then put it aside. And when I was confronted again with the question of life and death, I read it again at this time took his advice and did the exercises and suddenly the penny dropped. It, there was an actual seeing into who I really am. Can you describe that? That's most difficult. You know. Um, uh, okay. What effect did it have on you? 
The effect was to realize that my thinking about death, you know, the, the images I had of what the state might be or this knowing might be, that doesn't correspond to the actual reality. You know. But you know, the mind is so swift that it can even take that and turn it into another experience. Um, uh, and then you know, say, well, this is what I've got. I've, I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm somewhere now. You know, and and it was um, there were a number of those kinds of experiences. If that happened, I would say that happened around about 1993. That reading Douglas's I'm book again. Read you something that you you wrote about this because I, I thought this was very interesting. With it, uncluttered seeing, I'm revealed itself to I am. And it could not have been more personal. It was personal, yes, not in any way egocentric, but it existed only for me, including me. Now, there seems a dilemma in there, but it was something that was very clear to you. It was personal, but it wasn't personal in an egocentric way. Possibly what I would use now is yes. the word intimate. Yeah. Rather than personal, personal. intimate. Yes. Yes. Okay. In other words, it's something that is, you know, uh, there's a Rumi that says it's closer than your own breath. Mm. You know, um, yes. And you brought Douglas Harding to South Africa uh, and you spent little time with him. Yes, and he stayed with me. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, we arranged a series of events um, in and around Durban, um, including at the university. So uh, yeah. I was very um, fortunate to be uh, given this opportunity to do this. Yes, and, and we became friends. I visited him many times, he and, me, uh, he and his lovely wife, Catherine, at their home in Nacton. Okay. Uh, yes. So I'm going to read you something else that you, that you see, these are notes that you sent me. Um, at this point, you had a deep-seated search to find a way to bring total ease into my being. So I guess the feeling of unease, the feeling of fear, as you talked about earlier, the suffering was still there, but there was something else becoming clearer at the same time. Yes. I, I think that's a, a, a good way of putting it, that there was um, uh, a, wider, a wider perspective, a wider view. And uh, this was obviously intensified by my um, work with the Numenon Journal and being in contact with some interesting and I think some fairly amazing teachers uh, from around the world, you know, and I think what one was then doing wasn't a form of spiritual shopping, no. You know, it's not, you know, will this work for me? No, it's, it's really finding an approach that you resonate with or a language that you resonate with, you know. Um, and, and certainly um, Byron Katie's questioning, which I resonated with because really it was something that um, was a condensed form of what Krishnamurti had been saying. He said, you, know, you would always say, question, you know, uh, look at how we construct our self-image. You know, those are the kinds of things he would communicate. And, and uh, or look at your, your belief systems. And yeah, Katie came up with this, the four questions, simply asking, is it true? Can you really know that? Let's go through these. So the, the afterwards, again, you discovered a book. It was Byron Katie's biography. And you, you got invited to Holland, I think it was, to yes. do a five-day workshop with her. Yes. And something very significant happened through these questions. And so the first question is... Is it true? So you ask yourself, is it true? Yeah. And then... Um, can you really know it's true? Can you really know it's true? Yeah. And the third question... Uh, what would you be uh, without this... How, how, what would you be without this, this thought? What would you be without this thought? So you start to turn it in. Yes. To see. So, so what sorry. The third. The third one is really. When you have this thought, what does it do to you? 
So the, you know, okay. after these two questions, is it true? Can you really know it's true? Yes. What happens to you when you have this thought? So it, 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 it forces the mind to, to, to be truthful, to, to inquire, how do I feel when I have this thought? And what would I be without this thought? Okay, so that infers that without the thought, you're letting go yes. of part of your identity. Yes. And of course, there's, a, there's something, another process called the turnaround, which uh, allows you to examine um, these thoughts. Um, so in, in other words, um, my friend is abusive. Uh, the turnaround would be, you know, could not be equally true that my friend is not abusive. And it's again, it's the mind questioning itself because no friend is abusive 24 hours, you know. Um, but the way the mind constructs it, so this is, allows it to see another possibility. My friend is not, uh, my friend is not abusive could be equally true as the statement, my friend is abusive. Uh, what could also be equally true is I'm abusive to my, towards my friend. Maybe not physically, but, but in, my, in my mind. Yes. I'm constantly thinking abusive thoughts towards him, you know. So the questioning allows you to see the ways of the mind, the, way the, the ways in which the mind constructs its story and keeps the story running. Yes, no, I understand. Yeah. And I think, I think the third or fourth day of that conference in Holland, something quite significant happened to you, didn't it? Let's just run us through that. Well, um, I actually arrived in Holland absolutely fearful. Okay. Um, I, I had attended a, a conference in, in Cambridge uh, here in England and, 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 and the workshop with Katie was going to happen um, a day later. So I was flying from, from England to, uh, to Holland. Yeah. And um, I suddenly had this overwhelming fear uh, of being exposed, that Katie was going to put me through a process that was going to expose me. You know, that was just the rush. Yes, yeah. yes. And, and yeah. I was so, I was in such terror that on the plane, my mind was devising a way in which I could get back to South Africa and say to them, I'm sorry, my daughter was ill and I had to get back. You know, it was, okay. I was in absolute terror yeah. when I arrived in, in Amsterdam. And, um, and I know when I'm in terror is when I can't eat a Kit Kat. <laughs> yeah, chocolate, you know. Right. I mean, I love sweet things. And if I can't eat it, that means, you know, everything is shut off. I'm, I'm just uh, in another space. But I took the train from Schiphol um, Airport to um, the south of Holland, where the. And I, I kind of managed to calm myself down, you know. And um, the very next morning, um, I met Katie and she just hugged me and almost like cuddling a baby. She said, there, there, you know, it was almost as if there was a response to what I had been feeling. Mm. And then, um, and I went through the, the and, 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 you know, unlike some uh, therapy programs, you know, uh, there have been all kinds, you know, you, you name it. Um, there's there's nothing in in Katie's program that is threatening, uh, in in on the surface, they don't make you do things that you don't want to do, etc. You simply go through the questioning, and this particular program was designed around uh, business, uh, you know, bringing uh, bringing about business development or organizational development, and that's why I wanted to do with this because I was thinking of being becoming a consultant in that area and yeah. using the process. And I simply went through all the exercises and then, and then suddenly I was aware that the sphere was there in the background and it was growing. And um, she asked us to do over a lunchtime slot during lunch, uh, during lunch, an exercise. And uh, suddenly I confronted my own hypocrisy and that was the that was one of the key pillars upholding the fear. And uh, the hypocrisy was, and I'll tell you what it was, 
was intellectually and from a non-dual perspective, I was proclaiming, you know, I am no one, you know, I am no one, and um, and yet deep down there was a great need to be a someone. And when that was seen, there was an implosion. Yeah. And what did that implosion feel like? A release. A real release. Yeah. 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 So the, this needing to be, to, to to be a someone is what is one of the pillars that keeps up the sense of separation. Yeah. So the notes I made again from your notes was that the three levels. There's the terror of the imagined humiliation. And that rested on the fear, and that rested on the idea of being a somebody. Yeah. And that's what we all, I guess, are dealing with in terms of if we want to be truly free. Yeah. It's really being willing to let go or release yeah. that idea of being a somebody. somebody yes. And is that something you feel you've done now? Um, Ian, I would say that... Um, there may be there may be habits of thought that arise, you know, but um, really there's nothing that I am not uncomfortable to speak about, except where it might hurt other people. That's the only reason why I would. Yeah. So when you say there's habits of thought arising, then what's the process that goes on with you in terms of thought? Are you always a, is there always an awareness? of the thoughts that are arising? I would fr frame that differently. Because when you say, is there always an awareness, it implies an entity who's being aware. Okay. Right? Um, but the, the rather dramatic experience that occurred in 2007 uh, took another veil off it. I think a very significant veil of... Uh, this of this Talk illusion. Because this, this, this is quite a little story. Yeah. I know what you're going to say. Yeah. Well, okay. Um, well, you mentioned in your introduction that I, I'm, I'm an amateur magician yes. and, and mentalist. Um, and when I came back into academia, um, my very first class, I, um, I was trying to talk to my students about the left brain and the right brain that they're two different ways of processing knowledge. So they, I gave them an academic lecture in the left brain mode, and I gave the same lecture using magic, the same concepts. Okay. And I noticed that some of them were deeply affected because their belief systems said to them that this was real magic and that I should be someone to be avoided, you know, to stay away from me or this magic would, would rub off on them. And I, I was then interested in, 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 in researching this and, and what part magic could play in my academic teaching, uh, especially the whole idea of illusion and, and, and the brain and et cetera. And synchronistically, I was teaching a course for a, a, a huge multinational corp uh, corporation, the Toyota Company, and one of their young engineers was in my course. And my course happened to be, again, synchronistically, on coaching and mentoring. And he um, was gearing himself up to become a professional magician. And he, he's, he's stunning. And um, he soon became my mentor <laughs> in the art of, 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 of magical illusion. And... Um, and it was while I was running this course that I was all fired up, you know, meeting a fellow magician and somebody was really so good and he was teaching me some of the subtle points. I went to pick up my daughter uh, uh, from her cousin's home. Uh, um, and they're all young people there. And, and they, um, I, I had a DVD of my friend, of him doing magic, and I showed it to them and they got all excited. And they said to me, do some magic. And I did some magic, and uh, they enjoyed it. And uh, then another young uh, man came into the house, and they said, oh, 
show it, sh show him that trick, you know. And I showed him the trick and it went wrong. And I began laughing and then I disappeared. So what does that mean you disappear? So I have been struggling for a language for this for, for, for some time. So please bear with me. This sense of cribbing, this phenomenal manifestation, the way I'm experiencing myself now, for instance, had simply gone, but yet there was presence. Okay? Physiologically, I'm sure something happened to the brain through this rather uh, uncontrollable laughter, if you like. Um, Oxygen may have been cut off to the brain and something happened. So you passed out for a few yeah, seconds, for, yeah. They saw me slump down onto the chair, okay. etc. But there was no loss of consciousness. Okay. There was just a loss of feeling of being cribbin. Okay? And then, as the brain started to re-engage, I actually experienced the world as being reconstituting itself. You know, my daughter was in my visual in my visual sight and she was being re uh, reconstituted almost pixel by, by pixel. That, that's how it appeared to me visually. Um, and then the struggle was if there was a complete loss of cribbing who is reporting this fact? I think this is important. And I've, I've got a, an academic brain or an ac academically trained mind. And so I want to know this. And how do I communicate, you know? And I realize that actually Cribben doesn't exist at all to begin with. Okay. Um, and a metaphor in preparation for this, for this uh, interview, I said, how do I talk to Ian about this? And a, a metaphor arose for me, which I think comes from my theatre background. And it goes like this. Imagine that all your life you've been wearing a mask. You don't know you're wearing a mask. Right? And you wash your face and everything. But it's a mask. And one day it slips. And in the mirror, you see something that you've never seen before. The mask has, has slipped off. And it's not, it's not Cribben anymore. It's not Ian anymore. You know, there's just, there's just, there's just presence. But you don't know what this presence is. You can't personalize it. And, well, then, you know, the mask is put back on. And then you continue through life as the personality of that mask. But, but, and he has the rub. Now, but he has a knowing that is can never be shaken. Nobody can come to me and fool me and say, you know, but no, you know, you really are cribbing. So yeah. you had the experience of being whatever we call it, consciousness, awareness. With, without without any characteristics, yes. And then you saw cribbing being reconstructed. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You also mentioned um, the notes you sent me, Dr. Jill Bolte, who had the. She was a neuroscientist who yes. had the. Uh, um, had uh, she had a stroke. Stroke. That's a stroke. Yeah. yeah. And and she was then able to look from the left hand side of the brain and the right uh, right hand side of the brain. I could see completely different stories, and yes. that, that's on YouTube, which is a yes. very fascinating. It's a very powerful. I yeah. use that with my students. I use that particular video yeah. when we're exploring the left brain and the right brain. So you have this experience that you know you are not cribbing. It's a palpable experience. Was this like the final missing link on a process that, that you now stand in the ground of uh, awareness? I would put it this way, that um, it appears that the body-mind is still going through um, re realignments or into reintegrations 
that's what it appears to be, you know. Uh, I could still be concerned about whether I'm going to meet my flight, <laughs> you know, I'm going to be there on time. That's what the body-mind does. But it's what, but not just what is happening to Cribbins, it's what's happening all over. And that's the, the great mystery, it's the great awe. Um, you know, you had a, a, an interview uh, with Dr. Vijay Shankar. Yes, I did, right? yes. And, yeah. and, and he was saying in that interview, it's just the play of light and sound. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, and as I'm talking with you here, I'm not seeing, you know, some mystical lights and sounds. I'm seeing you as I think you are seeing me. But yet, it's a seeing in which all of this is, a, is occurring in awareness. And, um, you know, there's a very good uh, writer on the topic, uh, Greg Good, yes. uh, standing, yes. uh, standing as awareness. And I think he explores it in a language that I find very accessible and um, sound, you know. Uh, there's logic to it. And I think there's nothing, there's no harm in trying to go for a, a language that makes logical sense in trying to communicate this. And this is why I like what's happening in the field of neuroscience in their exploration of the brain and how the brain produces illusion. Because I think it's going to come together at some point. At the moment, they're not speaking the language of non-duality, but at some point, they're going to have to, you know. There have been, like the uh, late Francis, um, Francesco Varela uh, was a neuroscientist, and he looked at... Um, cognitive science and, 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 and the transpersonal. Um, and I think we are approaching this, and this is where I'm currently interested, what I'm currently interested in as an academic, you know, because I think we are, I, I don't know, I just moved to tell people, listen, yeah, you know, um, I'm not saying that you've got to go around and see yourself as an illusion, you know, no, don't do that. But see how illusions are constructed is very valuable. I think our children need to be told this. You know, uh, they need to be told how society manipulates you through the ad ad advertisements and politically and in all kinds of ways. And by doing so, we become um, alert. And I think through that kind of process, we, become, we, we begin to start to become self-aware. Before before um, we started the program, we were talking about death, and we did touch on the death of your father. And I know that your wife died several years ago, and that produced a further investigation, didn't it, into who actually died? Yes. Um, Ian, just in the last year, you know, two very close family members died, and. Uh, uh, both of them I regard as my, my, my parents. Um, and yet, um, and while there was tremendous, um, there was a tremendous emotional reaction to their deaths at the time, there's tremendous grieving. I find that uh, it's a process that the body-mind goes through. Uh, you know, you, somebody watching me would say I'm totally inconsolable. And then there's no waking up from that. And in the waking up from that, there's just no sense of separation. But it's not as if there is some, uh, some entity that, I'm, that one is in commune with. It's the most difficult thing to try to, to explain. Uh, um, there's just no sense of loss. There's just absolutely no sense of loss. So from where you are, I call it the ground of being, and I, other people call it awareness, consciousness. You don't feel there's a sense of loss because you don't feel the separation. Yes. Yeah. But yet, in this realm, I, <coughs> excuse me, in this realm here, if I'm aware that uh, a friend is very ill or someone close is... is um, is, is, is dying or, you know, or, or was, there's been a car accident, I would find myself, you know, be drawn into the emotional reactions like everyone else. But it doesn't last very long and then it reverts back to the state of, of non-separation. And is there an awareness of being drawn into the reaction? 
and you and you allow it to be happen is there an observation yes, yes, yeah. and you allow that to happen yes 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 there's, there's no there's no uh, there's no sense that oh I'm a spiritual person I don't even know what, don't even know what that would mean and I'm not supposed to behave this way you know I'm, I'm supposed to behave what you know without any uh, response uh, totally impersonal totally without any reaction no there's nothing of that there's a total involvement in life there's a total um, you know I still I still find the um, a great sense of uh, sadness at the destruction of, 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 of our natural resources right so that all still happens at the one level and another level knowing that all of it is perfectly fine so, you know this is the kind of contradiction that but it's not a contradiction that now produces some kind of angst it's just what it is you know and so if I move to I believe in South Africa they want to um, despoil our wonderful um, mountainous heritage through a process called fracking that is to search for natural gas. And it's really all an issue about money. The three Buddhist poisons, ill will, greed, and delusion. Delusion is believing that we are separate. Yeah. And once we have that, then of course we have ill will and we have greed. And that's what motivates our commercial mindset at the moment. And I'm thinking of writing a piece called, uh, you know, a fracking disaster. Yeah. You know, um, and that's my response to what's happening to... Uh, our lovely earth being dis uh, destroyed. You know, I've just had this thought, um, because you're a magician and obviously you do it in illusion and delusion, and you've pointed out that being separate individuals is in effect a delusion, which you know to be true now from your direct experience. And it's almost as, w as if we're maybe a giant experiment by a, by a magician from a different level, this planet, and he says, right... I'm just going to, going to create this giant delusion now and create all these, uh, these beings who are people running around thinking they're all separate and then the game is that they have to find their way back home and they have to realise that actually they're all connected and they're all one they yeah. all come from the same source. Yeah. And that's a, that's a good metaphor, you know. That's a good metaphor. And how do we... What would you say to people that were watching this programme and they can understand what you're saying and they understand you've had your own personal journey, Krishnamurti, Douglas Harding, Byron Katie, they've all provided in their own way steps for you which have been, you've integrated, they've revealed and they've been integrated and they've helped you find a realisation of who you really are. What would you say to people that somehow, they kind of get that in one way, how would they start? You know, I don't know the answer to that. I think everyone will start where they are going to start. You know, there's no formula. You know, there's, I, I can't see that there is a formula. The moment you have a formula, you have a religion being born. And if we just trust that, you know, you are, life is going to take you where it needs to take you, uh, you know. Um, but if they, if you're directly saying, these are people who are interested in non-duality and, you know, even there, some people respond to this uh, at first intellectually uh, because that's their makeup, very much like the way I am. And some people respond more to the heart, you know, and uh, something, more, something along the lines of uh, devotion is what works for them, you know. Um, but maybe it's just going back to the Byron Katie question, you know, do we really want to know what's true? Do we really want to know what's true? Yeah. Or is that too terrifying for us? Yes. Well, it, it, it's funny enough, I brought along a book which I just re-dug out of uh, the library we got at home there. I thought it's kind of how to do, what to do when nothing works. The Manual for the Work by Byron Katie. It's not written by her, but it's written by someone close to her. And it's very practical. Yes. And I suppose anyone that is interested, it's just a very cheap book to pick up. They can see if this is the basis of experiment for them, because that very much is 
about taking habitual thoughts and then questioning how true those thoughts are. And if you really question something like could happen with you, like it collapses back in the mind and another level of conditioning is evaporated really, isn't yes. it? Yes. And that brings us closer to the source. There's less yes. in the way, less obscuration in the way. Do you have generally a, f a good feeling for mankind as the future of mankind? How do you, because it, it's interesting in the previous interview uh, um, I was doing with, with um, Rupert Spiro, we were, we were talking about really that everybody is looking for the same thing. Everybody wants happiness yes. and peace. It's very simple. People look in different ways and for, for many people it's to do with material things, which is understandable, especially if you don't have them. And then you get more and you get more and you get more and you're still not happy. And you think, well, I'm not happy because I need some more. Yeah. And I think you and I very much know that it's about looking in, starting to look in, looking as deeply as you can. And something then new and very precious starts to get revealed. Yeah. Well, I would say that, um, you know... Uh, the thought doesn't really arise as insistently as it used to about, you know, where is mankind going to go? You know, or what's going to become of mankind? Uh, because really, all I know, in an absolute sense, is myself. Right? And it could, pre it could be shown later on, and it wouldn't surprise me that all of this was just some kind of holographic show. <laughs> And so my, my responsibility is to myself. In other words, to make certain that I um, have brought this understanding into some kind of embodiment. In other words, in other words do, have I changed my perception? Am I seeing things differently and clearly? And I think when that happens then there's something rather startling that starts to emerge about what the so-called world is, but we can't go into that today. Okay. okay. You're tantalising us there, are you, for a part two? <laughs> well, you know, uh, that's part of the theatre <laughs> the man in me. Yeah. Um, no, but I'm, I'm just saying that um, really... It, uh, I don't have the language yet to communicate because the moment you start saying, well, you know, how can I make the world better? It's already you and the world. They're two things. So you've created object, subject yeah. and object yes. again. Yeah. But yet it may, it may be seen that someone, Cribben, is involved in doing something that appears to be beneficial or altruistic or humanitarian or what have you, or maybe not. But um, yes, I think the way to describe it is that this, it's, it is being in awe of a, of a great drama, you know, that is spontaneously happening. And um, And you, well, for me, you can only really, you can only really see it as a drama because what has been removed is the sense that you know I am a separate object, a separate real object amongst other so-called separate real objects. So if the reality of your own existence implodes, then what is there? Not, not, I'm talking about the reality of the phenomenal existence. I'm not talking about the, the reality as of the ground of being or presence or whatever else you want to call it. And what is there? Yeah. See, that can't be put into words. Do you feel it now? It's there. Can you describe it at all? The feeling you have? No, I can't describe it, but you know it. 
but I'm interviewing you. <laughs> the moment we describe it, we are already, we're already a step away from it. Maybe people feel it who are watching, that's a possibility. So we have, we have about five minutes left. Um, it would be nice just to sit here in silence, but I'm also aware that we're making a TV programme and uh, we also need to keep it going as such. Uh, there was this book which you, I don't know if you published it, but came out about your theatre work. And I just, I just thought, it's, it's not really written by you, this book. It's comments from students who were in this theatre group, self-discoveries through theatre. Yes. And something was very touching and moving. I don't know if I can find... There was one piece that I marked, and yet this series was called Moments. Yes. The first... And this is written by one of the students, someone called Usha. My first sense of moments came to me when you asked us to look at some natural elements when we wake up in the morning. I've begun doing this every morning, and gradually I've begun to feel one with whatever I looked at. I felt a presence. I felt good. I thought that was very sweet because someone obviously didn't know anything about what presence was, but they just felt presence and they felt good. And that's where I think we all as human beings want to go. And it's just so difficult. We struggle a lot of the time trying to have this basic presence wanting to know who we really are. And it's such a minefield getting there. And you've somehow navigated the minefield. And, of course, on another level, from what you've said, there isn't a crib in any way, so there was no minefield and there was nothing to navigate. But I'm just speaking, trying yeah, to speak in a yeah. clear way people understand. Yeah. Um, but it must be very rewarding to somehow be there. I, 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 there's no thoughts about it. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know, you know, I don't know yeah. if it's rewarding or not. It, it's, uh, yeah, you know, it's just what is. It's, it's what, what is, is, yeah. And the what is is what you are. Everything. Maybe I'm trying too hard to uh, just clarify things yeah. for people. And, no, 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 and, and that's fine too, and that's fine too. You know that's fine. It's that's is, yeah. that's that's fine too. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 a, lot, a lot of my search was about trying to find the language. I mean, I read a book. You may have, re you know, read it uh, by Bernadette Roberts. Yes. Of yes. Course. You know. The of yeah. And I was very angry when I read the book. Yeah. Because. And I, I, it was a emotional reaction, really, because, at some deeper level, she was challenging me. Yes. But I wanted to know, how could she talk about no self? Who's writing this? Who's saying I've got no self? You understand? Yes. I, and I, it, makes no, it made no sense to my academic brain. Yeah. And I was really angry at the end of the book, you know, and I felt that she should have clarified this. And it's only when you go through that experience yourself, like when I disappeared, yeah. that you actually realize that um, it's absolutely true. There is no self. Mm. And then, of course, now you try to communicate it, or you communicate it, and then people say, but who's saying there is no self? You know, and, um, and I, but I think also uh, the, the language will develop a, as we go along. Um, Greg Good is coming up with a new book, and I've actually said to him, you know, please address these concerns, because it would be lovely to have a book which is almost like a primer for students, and it yeah. addresses these essential questions. In yeah, new words, in new words yeah. and, and which points directly, you know. Okay. Yeah. Kruben, we need to finish. I've yes. enjoyed being with you here and uh, I've learned a lot more about you. Um, when you tell the story that you told of disappearing, if people might like to try and find this on YouTube. I found it on news on TED TV. And you do, a, you do a great magic trick, actually, which we couldn't really do in the studio here. It wasn't practical. But I would recommend that people look up, I guess they just put your name, Dr. Cribben Pillay and oh, just Ted Cribben TV, Pillay, yes. and uh, they'll find this little trick that accompanies the basic story of disappearing. So thank you again. Thank you, Ian, and thank you for inviting me.
thank you for coming along and watching us wherever you are on Conscious TV. And we're always looking for interesting people like Cribben, so who isn't necessarily a direct obvious fit for Conscious TV. So if you do know of anyone and you want to uh, volunteer yourself, then uh, drop us a line. And I hope we see you again soon. Goodbye.